my first job, working as a real job where you actually received a paycheck, was at a McDonald's restaurant, as most of you know that. And uh, I started when I was 16 years old, and I worked there for about two and a half years until I went off to college. And uh, by the time I had been there for uh, you know a couple of years, I was pretty good at what I did. And the, um, they even put me up into the point of the low-level management by the time I was 18 years old. Uh, but before I received that level, there were other people who were ahead of me, and my job did not involve uh, working with the shake machine. Okay? The shake machine was something which uh, they didn't want me to mess with. I think part of it was because I wasn't quite 18 yet, and so therefore I wasn't supposed to mess with all the operations that went along with it because I'd pressurized tanks and whatnot. I bring this up because the people who were over 18 and had uh, basically my level of, of um, authority were able to open up the shake machine and you had the different flavors. You had the chocolate, you had the vanilla, you had the, you had the special flavor, and then you had the chocolate. And then what would happen is you put the different syrups into the pressurized containers and then you had the shake mix and the shake machine, what it would do, it was to take the shake mix, mix it with the different flavors, and then you'd get your, the shake that you wanted, obviously. Well, the people who were of the uh, low-level management, like myself, but were a little bit older, had the access to the syrup part. And what they would do is they would get a screwdriver and they would twist on the calibration lines and they would add more chocolate to their shakes. That's right. And so most people get a very, very light brown chocolate milkshake. They were getting a dark brown chocolate milkshake. I thought, man, that's pretty good. Now, restaurants don't like that very much because restaurants uh, measure everything, okay? how many cups they use, how much orange juice is used, how much bacon is used, how much meat is used, and how much syrup is used. And so what they would do is they would do a weekly calibration. And in the weekly calibration, they would say, oh my goodness, we're, we're using a ton of chocolate here. And so they would get a little bit angry about that. And they'd, they'd get, the next week, they'd get a little angry. And the next week, they'd get a little bit angry. So finally, they started doing daily calibration. And in the daily calibration, they brought out this big book, because McDonald's had books for everything. And they brought out the big books, and the big book was the book of truth. They brought out the big, the big book of McDonald's truth, and it said, you shall have this much shake mix for this much syrup, and you would have to calibrate it every single day until they finally figured out what was going on. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we take our position, the position in which we find ourselves, and say, aha, now I have arrived a little bit, I have a little bit of authority, and I think I'm going to get a little extra syrup. People do this all the time. We just finished up an election. People get into a political office because, because they get a little extra syrup, do they not? Yes, they do. We all know that's what, what's going on. So yeah, people do this all the time. And so people want to, to go ahead and add a little extra syrup to their shake. That's what they want. Here's the deal, though, is there is a greater authority than ourselves, and the greater authority comes and says, no, 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 no. That's not what it's like. The matter, matter of fact, we need to get things appropriate. And the only way to make things appropriate are to take the distorted extra syrup and bring it back and calibrate it to the truth. As we come this morning, we're going to come to the book of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 10. We're finishing up, well, we're not quite finishing up the 10th chapter, but Mark chapter 10, we're going to be in verse 32 through 45. And what we see here is we see that the disciples, the disciples see themselves one more time we have seen this in chapter 8, we have seen this in chapter 9, we continue to see it in chapter 10. What we see is we see that the disciples, because of the relationship with Jesus, they believe that they can turn up, turn up the syrup to get a few extra benefits from following Jesus that the regular person does not get. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for the perks which come along with the position. So I want you to come to Mark chapter 10 and verses 32, and we'll finish up through, through, in verse 45. But as we do so, what we're seeing here is we're seeing people desiring to use their position to get ahead. We're seeing people who are trying to get the perks which do not belong to them. And what Jesus is going to do, is talking to his disciples one more time, is he's going to calibrate them to the truth. He's going to bring them back to where they're supposed to be. Instead of people looking for the, the syrup, he's going to bring them back to how it should be. So let us come to Mark chapter 10 and verse 32. Uh, interestingly enough, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as we come to this section, we are seeing uh, 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 an, an amazing thing about Jesus and his leadership. So let me just read for us the, this first paragraph. 
And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to them. And he said, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. Interesting, as we look at verse 32, we see here that Jesus is not hanging back, but he is blazing the way. Notice here that he is walking ahead of them. Jesus is not hesitant. He is not fearful. He is not cowering. He is headed towards Jerusalem. You say, well, why is that a big deal? It's because Jesus has already had several conflicts with the Jewish leadership down in Jerusalem. Now, Mark has most of Jesus' ministry up in the Galilee area, but we know from other gospel accounts in Matthew and Luke and John, we know that Jesus was, was oftentimes in Jerusalem, and things have not always gone very smoothly. So as they are headed up to Jerusalem, we see that Jesus, he is leading the way, he has set his face, he is headed up there, and we see that the disciples are behind him, and how are they described? And they were amazed, and those who followed him were afraid. They are fearful of what's going to happen. They, they, they don't like the fact that Jesus is putting himself at such a risk. And what does Jesus respond to them? He says, <clears throat> he takes the twelve, he takes them to, a, to the side, and he says, listen, see, we, notice here the we, by the way, we are going up. Jesus is including the disciples. They're going to come along with him, sure enough. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. Now, I want us to uh, appreciate uh, the the fact that that, that Jesus understands what is going to happen to him. He is going willingly. He is not going as a victim. He is not some sort of uh, idiot that has been trapped. This is an extremely brave thing which Jesus is doing. And this is important for us as well, because remember, Mark is writing his gospel primarily for people who are of a Gentilic background. They're Gentiles, not a Jewish background. And he is writing it to them. And if you are a Gentile and you're reading this gospel, you're saying to yourself, hmm, Jesus, he must not have thought things through. Or Jesus, perhaps he was trapped. Or perhaps Jesus was not as strong as he thought he was. Jesus is, for the, very, for the third time, predicting what's going to happen to him. So Jesus is not caught off guard in any of this. Not only is he not caught off guard, he is willing to go up. Not only is he willing to go up, he is leading his disciples and saying, we're going. That's pretty amazing. Notice, look at the detail. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered. Now, the word here, delivered, yes, means the word delivered, but it also means betrayed. The Greek word parodidomai, and so what he has, it's the idea that you want a person is, is betrayed into the hands of another. If you were to go to, and we'll do that because we have time, if we go to Mark chapter 14, and in verse 10, we see that very word. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him. That's to deliver. It's the same Greek word, him to them. Jesus is going to be handed over. He is going to be betrayed. Even in this particular section here, we see that Jesus already understands what's going to happen to him. So again, if you are a, of a Greek background and you're reading about this Jesus for the very first time and you're trying to figure out, how does this Jesus, who claims to be the Savior of the world, how did he get tricked? This is answering the question. Jesus is not tricked. He is not fooled. Three times in a row, Chapters 8, chapters 9, chapters 10. Jesus predicts that this will happen to him. And he is going to be betrayed. One of his very own is going to give him up. It's a big deal. Notice here, once again, the, the breadth and the depth of, the, of what's going to happen to him. Uh, he'll be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes. So he's going to be handed over to the Jewish leadership. And they, that is the Jewish leadership, will condemn him to death. But notice this, and deliver him. Same word, by the way, betray him over to the Gentiles. You know, if if Jesus was a heretic in the Jewish mind, you would think that Jesus would be stoned to death. But what we see is we see the Jewish leadership is willing to arrest Jesus, condemn him to death, and then give him to the Gentiles. That's an extra layer of specificity, which most people could not predict. 
But Jesus does. Notice in verse 24, and they will mock him, they will spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And again, if you are considering following Jesus, you are a Gentile in the first century, and you're trying to figure out why this Jesus is special. But you know that Jesus was crucified, and all of this type of stuff has happened to him. You're saying, I don't think I could follow a guy like that, but he knows it ahead of time. And then look at this last little nugget. And after three days he will rise. If I wanted to, I could predict my death. I could. I could say, today I will die. And I can walk down to the train tracks, and I can wait for the speeding train to wipe me out. Right? I could. I'm not not planning that. If I did that, today I'm going to die, and splatola. One thing which I could not predict, I could not predict that I would rise three days later. I might be able to pick the day of my death, but I'm, there's no way in the world that I can pick the day of my resurrection. I can't predict that, oh, they'll go ahead and they'll scoop me up what's left of me off of the tracks and put me over in a box here, and in three days... I'll rise. Can't do that. Jesus is saying something which, frankly, if we're listening to him, and if we are part of the group, okay, if we're part of the 12, and we're listening to Jesus, we're saying, that doesn't make any sense at all. Nobody can make that type of prediction, Jesus. That's, 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 in a sense, you're saying in the back of your mind, that's nonsensical. Are you not? But Jesus is doing that. And once again, screams to us the necessity and the importance of the true fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus doesn't rise, does, nothing works. We, you know, it's interesting, we watched a movie here at the church on, on Friday called The Case for Christ. And in that movie, they were talking about if you want to disprove Christianity, if you want to go ahead and say it's a complete house of cards, you, you prove the resurrection of Jesus as false. And if you can do that, then, then the whole, all of Christianity is a lie. Jesus is predicting his resurrection. In three days I will rise. The great thing is, is that he does rise. Okay? We know we serve a risen Savior. Amen? Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Sometimes I just have to you know, beg that out of you. So this is what we have. So we've got Jesus, and Jesus is telling him, hey, by the way, we're going all the way up here, and, and, and I'm going to die. By the way, you're coming with me, and, and I'm going to be betrayed. Now, this is the third time. We've, we've, we've seen it in chapter 8. We've seen it in chapter 9. We've seen it in chapter 10. Three different times. So you would think that would, perhaps in the disciples' minds, they're saying, oh, now I get it. Or, you know what? He might be serious about this. No. Third time is not the charm. It is not. The disciples, for whatever reason, still are dismissing Jesus. And look at verse 35. And by the way, why? Because they are so excited about Jesus and they believe he is the Messiah, they believe he is the one who is going to lead them to some sort of military victory, and they believe that Jesus is the one, and hooking themselves to him will give them a little bit more syrup. He is the sweetness to their lives, ladies and gentlemen, and it makes no sense whatsoever that Jesus would die at the hands of the Romans, let alone whatever he's talking about, this resurrection thing. How do I know this? Because of verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. We want a blank check, Jesus. We would like you to do whatever we ask from you. Um, And Jesus says, What do you want? Verse 37. And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now, uh, we get a few insights here. Number one, we see that they're asking for a blank check. But number two, I, I like it because one of the great things about having four gospel accounts is that we can see and com- com- compare and contrast. And we come to, uh, so I want you to keep your finger in Mark, but I want you to go over to uh, Matthew. In Matthew chapter, oh, I misplaced it here. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20. Verse 20. 
we get a little extra detail here, which I think is hysterical. If you look at verses 17, 18, and 19, Jesus is going to foretell his death for the third time. And then look at verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she said to him, uh, 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 and asked him for something, and he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right and one at the left. Isn't that awesome? So in Matthew, we get this little extra detail. In Mark, it looks like James and John, they themselves are asking Jesus this. But in Matthew, he gives us this little bit more information, and they've brought their mama, and they said, Mama, go talk to Jesus for us, and he'll probably listen to you. Isn't that amazing? Because I think they're a little bit scared of asking Jesus for too many things, and they're getting turned down, so they say, well, maybe we'll talk to Mama, and Mama will talk to him, and Jesus will have a soft spot for Mama, and, 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 and he'll say yes. This is political ploy, is it not? This is pretty amazing. So here we have it, and they're asking Mama. Mama comes up, and Mama's going to ask them, you know, hey, can my boys one sit at the left, one sit at the right? That'll be fantastic. And, and understand that these are primo positions, you know? It's like, oh, here's the president, if you will, and there's the vice president, and there's the, I don't know, speaker of the house or whatever it is. Uh, and and here, here we come. So they're, they're pretty excited about this. And what has Jesus just said? Oh, I'm going to be handed over, I'll be betrayed, I'll be spit upon, I'll be flogged, I will be cussed and I'll be killed. And what are they asking for? Syrup. They want the perks of the position. Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 8, we get the confession of Peter. And who do people say that I am? Uh, Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We get the confession of Peter. Awesome. And then Jesus tells him for the first time, I'm going to die. I'm going to be betrayed. And Peter rebukes Jesus. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And Jesus rebukes Peter. Mark chapter 10, or 9, Mount of Transfiguration. Who goes with Jesus? Peter? Peter, James, and John. The inner three. We already have in chapter 8, we have Peter who is, who is rebuked for his audacity for rebuking the Son of God. Mark chapter 9, we see them go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mark chapter 10, for the third time, Jesus tells that he is going to be betrayed. And we see numbers 2 and numbers 3 in the inner three, still vying for position and for the syrup that the position affords. The three guys who are closest to Jesus are not getting it, are, are, are not understanding their role in following Jesus. They do not understand who Jesus is fully, and they do not understand their role as disciples. They don't get it. You know, sometimes you like to think, boy, I sure would like to be walking around with Jesus and following him and seeing the miracles, and boy, I would be a great follower. Peter, James, John, Numbers 1, 2, and 3, F, F minus, F minus. Right? And Jesus, I believe Jesus looks upon these two men with the love which he had for the rich young ruler. And he says, Oh, fellas. He says, You do not know what you ask. Verse 38 Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And look at this. Look at this. Foolish and ignorant and full of pride answer, we are able. 
What's he talking about a cup here and baptism here? Is he talking about the Lord's table or baptism? What is he talking about here? Jesus is speaking of an identity here, folks. Uh, That's what Jesus is speaking about. To drink the cup is an allusion here to to, um, the the cup of the wrath of God, if you will. Again, if you stay in Mark and we turn to a couple of passages, we come to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 51. And in verse 17, we see that this, old, this is an Old Testament uh, usage. Uh, it, it's a common understanding. So Isaiah 51 and verse 17. Wake yourselves, wake yourselves. Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. And the idea to drink the cup is to drink the cup of judgment. Jesus will speak about this uh, close, or even closer to his death. Uh, go to, let's look at John, look at the Gospel of John. And in John chapter 18 and verse 11, Jesus is being betrayed. Peter will try to defend him with the sword. And in John chapter 18 and verse 11, I'll pick it up in verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it out and struck the high priest's servant. And cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given to me? Shall shall I not take upon the wrath of God for the the sins of the world? Shall I not do it? Go Go back to the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 14, again, we see the same vocabulary is used. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 36. And Jesus, he is praying. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And then Jesus is praying and he's praying in the garden. And if there is any way, Father, that this, this cup, this cup of wrath that, that might be taken from me, that I might not have to go through it, then take it from me. But what we know here, it's unanswered, but we understand that the cup cannot be taken from Christ, for he is uniquely qualified and he will receive the cup. And he will drink it to its dregs. And he will take the full wrath of God. It speaks of baptism, if we go back into Mark, Mark chapter 10, that is. And in Mark chapter 10, he, he talks to them, he says, Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And the idea of baptism here is always identity, by the way. When a person is baptized, they are being identified with Christ. And what he is saying here, can you be identified with the suffering with which I am going to suffer? To which they say, oh, yes, we can. So Jesus says, okay, the cup that I drink, you will drink. Fellas, you're going to take plenty of wrath, I tell you that. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you'll be baptized. We know from Acts chapter 12 and verse 11 that James is the first, first martyr of the, of the apostles. And he is killed. We know that John, in, uh, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 1 and verse 9, we know that John... We don't know a whole lot about him. We know that he is hounded and he is persecuted, but certainly within Scripture we do know this, that in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, that John is exiled to the island of Patmos. Life has been difficult for them. Jesus says, yeah, you're you're, you're going to have it, boys. Verse 40, but to sit at my right hand or to my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. I'm sorry, but you're not going to get the perks of membership. You don't get the the syrup. What Jesus is doing, he is calibrating them to the truth. Well, the rest of the disciples, of course, are outraged by this because they are holier than James and John. No. No. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Are they upset because uh, they're upset with James and John's their bad behavior? Are they saying, how dare you? Haven't you been listening to Jesus' messages about being a servant? No, that's not why they're angry. 
They were angry because they believed that James and John were trying to sneak into a position, even using Mama to help out. And they were using James and John. James and John are, are perceived here as people who are, who are trying to get ahead of the rest of the disciples. We'll say, how can I say that? We'll look at 9.33. Chapter 9, and verse 33. It wasn't that long ago. With Remember, what were they doing? They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they were arguing with one another about who was the greatest. That mentality has not, has not, has not, has not escaped from them. And Jesus has told them three different times, in chapter 8, in chapter 9, and now in chapter 10, I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And the rest of the disciples are angry at James and John, and they're angry at James and John because James and John are playing politics, they are trying to get ahead, and they want the very same position. And Jesus essentially is saying, you still don't know what it means to be a disciple. You still don't get it. And one more time at least, in verses 42 through 45, Jesus will try to calibrate them to the truth. Guys, you're following me for the perks. You want the extra syrup? Let me tell you one more time how it's supposed to be. And Jesus called them to him and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Listen, if you're in the Roman Empire, you know that Caesar is Caesar. He's the authority. If you have a, if you have a, you know, a sub-king or a ruler of some other sort elsewhere, you know that they rule with a heavy hand. You know that they can, they, they can kill you if they desire. The Gentiles lord it over them. They use their power. And they use their power to keep people in control. But you, <clears throat> but it shall not be so among you. Now you disciples, it's to be different. Whoever would be greatest among you must be your servant. This is not the role which they are looking for. They are looking for Jesus commander-in-chief and they as chief lieutenants. They are not looking for the role of servant. I want to be a servant. So that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the syrup. I'm not looking for servanthood. Whoever would be great among you must be a servant. Remember, we already saw that in chapter 9. They were arguing who's the greatest. And Jesus says, then be a servant. Verse 44, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Notice here, the servant and slave, they're two different words here. One is the word which, actually, sometimes we will we'll translate it deacon. It's the di uh, diakonos. And the other one is doulos, which is slave. And a slave's worse than a servant. You want to be first, then you need to be slave-like. They're looking for the perks, and Jesus is telling them, that's not how it works in this world. If you're going to be a follower of me, then you're entering into a life of servanthood. Listen, we just went through a week of, uh, of elections, and we have people who want to be in power and, and want to have the world elect them, or have you know, America elect them, and therefore to be able to exert their power. And you may like the results or you may dislike the results, but frankly, Christian, Christians have always been asked to lead from below and from the grassroots more so than from the top. In many respects, it, it, it is in irrelevancy as to who wins the elections because we are still supposed to be a people who serve and slave and put other people in front of us. The early church, think of the early church, first century church, second century church. Think of that church. What advantages did the early church have? Nada. They have no buildings. They have no seminary. They do not have as much scripture as we have. They have no formal training oftentimes. After a generation after Jesus, there's no longer the firsthand testimony of Jesus. They don't have the advantages. In many respects, Christianity should have been crushed and creamed, and it should never have been much of anything upon the face of this earth. But somehow or another, it kept on going. Why? Because people understood that Jesus truly rose from the dead, 
They could not deny that. And if that is true, they finally said that we need to be servants like Jesus said. And it is the Christian who is burying the dead. It is the Christian who is valuing life. It is the Christian who is leading from below. We still have that ability. And it makes no difference who is in the White House or who is in the governor's office. We still have the authority and the command to serve one another. I don't care who is in office because we can serve that way. You know, I was uh, contacted probably a couple years ago uh, about, uh, by a woman. She's an elderly woman. She wanted to talk to me and uh, uh, had me come over. Very sweet woman. And uh, she was looking for a different church. I said, well, why exactly is that? She says, I'm looking for a different church because our pastor um, has informed the congregation that the congregation... Uh, does not love him, and it's clear because the congregation has not bought him a new Cadillac. It seems kind of silly. I mean, if you're going to go for a car, you might as well go for a, you know, Corvette. But yeah, Ferrari, might as well. Yeah, Yeah, pick your car. Okay, but that's but that's what she's telling me. She said the congreg the pastor was upset because he wanted the Cadillac. And the church obviously didn't love him because they didn't give him a Cadillac. And I thought, holy smoke, what kind of nonsense is that? Don't buy me a Cadillac, by the way. Okay. We are to be people who serve. We, we don't follow Jesus for the perks. There are people out there, ladies and gentlemen, who would take the name of Jesus, and they'll preach a pseudo-gospel message, and they'll tell people, well, if you give given this much money, then God will give you this much money back. The health, wealth, and prosperity people out there. And what they're telling people out there, follow Jesus and you get the syrup. Follow Jesus and you get the perks. That's what it's all about. That's the Christian way. Folks, that's a false gospel. Those people who say that are perverters of the truth. They are liars. And they should be ashamed of themselves. I think I'm clear on that, am I not? Do not fall for that. Keeping it rated G. Do not fall for that. That's close. (laughs) <laughs> That's how it goes sometimes. Whoever would be first among you must be a slave for all. Now look at verse 45. For even the Son of Man, Jesus speaking himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If you are a first century Gentile reading the Gospel of Mark, and you're looking at this and you're saying, how is it that this Jesus, this Jewish leader, this one who who supposedly rose from the dead, and everybody's talking about him, how in the world should I, why in the world should I follow him? Seems like he was trapped and killed and executed, and so it doesn't make any sense that I'd follow him. Jesus understands that he is giving his life as a ransom. He is paying for the sins of the world in what he is doing. He is not surprised. He is not caught off guard. I mean, why would you do that? Why why does Jesus do this? Do you know that Jesus goes to the cross because he loves you? Jesus... In the words of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, Jesus, looking to Jesus, the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, Jesus, I'm going to do what I have to do, and I'm doing it for these people because they are helpless. They are lost in their sin. They are condemned to hell. Without me, I have to come. And Jesus will take the cup. I came across a short little article um, someplace online. It's talked about, pa- there was a, I guess there was a pastor back in New York or something like that, had some sort of moral failure. He was well-known. I, I don't know who he is, but he is well-known by other people. 
And the article in response to this moral failure said, pastors need to stop trying to be rock stars. And I said, boy, isn't that the truth? We don't need pastors who, who are trying to develop a cult of personality. We don't need that. We need pastors who point to Jesus Christ. I am nothing. Jesus Christ is everything, right? I mean, again, a lot of times we think that we're really, really important until that train runs us over, and then what? guess what? Everybody, you know, life goes on. But Jesus remains. Folks, this doesn't just apply to pastors. It applies to every single one of us. Our lives are designed to be of service. Our lives are designed to be slaves for Christ and to point to the one who can save everybody else. We fail in this life. Fail! Fail in this life if we do not learn from the ignorance of the disciples. The disciples, at least three different times, dismiss Jesus's warning his prediction that he was going to die, his passion sections, three different times they deny it. We need to be a people who will accept it and understand that Jesus dies, but understand that as we follow Jesus, we too die. We follow him. We follow him. And it is never about the perks. It is never about the syrup. It is always about service for him. Always. So, do you follow Jesus for the things which you get, the extras, or do you follow him because he's your savior? And if he's your savior, are you willing to follow him all the way? See? I think Mark chapter 8, 9, and 10 are some of the, as a whole, some, some of the most amazingly powerful sections of Scripture that you can come across.